Anyway, anyway, this is this is this is my draft for for a new, hopefully better, lecture on mill. Yeah, that's all mill. All of this is mill. So uh, let me be brief. So um, the first question is rules. Mill cares about rules a lot, and not just rules, but also habits. Human beings are ruled by habit. We are creatures of habit. So you could say it's Mill's assumption, but it's also his observation. So it's not just his assumption, it's also his conclusion, right? Human beings are ruled by habit. So in terms of the is, like the is ought problem, if you want, in terms of the is, we, as a matter of fact, we are ruled by habit. And also he talks about this conditioning, like, you know, classical, classical conditioning, operant conditioning, how through education, through habituation, people can... It's like he, the example he gives is people don't care about money originally because it's just pieces of paper, but you can condition people, habituate people to value money for its own sake, right? And so basically he says that this power can be used for good, it can be used for evil. And so basically you have to remember that utilitarianism is a radically reformist doctrine. It's a radically reformist doctrine. So we uh, um, basically, Mill begins with the assumption that some of our rules, regulations, customs, are good and some are maybe bad and deleterious. So what is the what is the standard? The standard by which we judge rules to be good or bad is utility. Now, can we just calculate utility and not worry about rules? Mill says this will not work. Peter Berger in Bouch and Kelly talks about an act utilitarian justification of rule utilitarianism. If we want to maximize utility, we need rules. Because rules make society predictable. They make it more efficient. Like if we drive on the road, there are no rules. We cannot get anywhere. So we need rules. It maximizes utility. So Mill, I mean, maybe that you can have some exceptions, but in general, Mill thinks that you should have as few exceptions as possible. He says, if you lie as an exception, okay, maybe this one time, this will increase utility. However, it undermines the institution of telling, the truth, truth, tell, of truth telling. This undermines a very important principle in society. So in general, Mill is against exceptions as much as possible. So anyway, so, so rules, first of all, p people follow rules out of psychological propensity because this is the way humans work and animals work as well, habituation. The, the animal world is built on habituation, right? But also convenient, it makes life much more convenient. So anyway, so utility is the ultimate criterion, but then we derive these rules, rules of thumb, secondary principles from utility, right? And again, so utilitarianism is a radically reformist doctrine. So Mill, you know, when we talk about this, oh, um, sort of everything that's, I mean, the self-regarding um, domain of action is just so small. It's like, you want to drive without a seatbelt? No, you shouldn't do that because that can harm others or like you become an invalid and you know, you cannot contribute to the community so you shouldn't do that, right? It's like, um, should, you, should you drink? Should you smoke? And again, like, no, se secondhand smoking, you shouldn't ruin your life. You should be, if, if, you, if you damage society or yourself, you should be punished. If not by law, then by uh, public opinion, if not by public opinion, then by your own conscience. So isn't Mill totalitarian? Well, no. Mill is a radical reformist. He thinks that we have all sorts of stupid, archaic prejudice, which are dangerous, deleterious, and irrational. So one contemporary example could be prejudice against homosexuality. Mill would have none of that. You know, an example given by the University of London, uh, Turing, Turing, Alan Turing, right? So driven to suicide because of his homosexuality. Who, who, who benefited from that? Mill is going to say, this is an old, irrational, stupid doctrine. It, har it has harmed Alan Turing, it harms homosexuals, but it also harms all of us because, you know, Alan Turing was a wonderful mathematician. We are, you know, you understand, we, we, we lose this opportunity. Uh, uh, likewise, um, he thinks about how that most people have children without thinking about whether they should have children, whether it's a good idea. People don't bother to use contraception or don't know about contraception. This is all deeply irrational for Mill, right? So this is, this is one avenue of reform. Another avenue of reform in male is systematic oppression. So male domination of women is harm. So it's harm principle. Men should not be allowed to dominate women. Right? Likewise, if you, th if you think about Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, uh, um, uh, Bill Gates, they have tremendous amount of, amounts of money engaging these speculations on Wall Street so, w w uh, while people are starving. This is harm. This is harm. Bezos and Musk do not have some kind of natural a priori right for their wealth. Mill would be definitely in favor of progressive taxation, right? So, so Mill, in, in general, I think is kind of blind to the issue of class. And this is, I think, a big problem in Mill. But it's not a problem with his philosophy. It's a problem with Mill himself, right? 
Like, I think Marx, something like Marx's conclusions do follow from Mill's premises. It's just that Mill himself is just too optimistic. He doesn't understand that there's room for this kind of systematic domination, class domination. He talks about gender domination. He doesn't really understand class domination very well. Anyway, so what we want ultimately is, again, we need to change laws, regulations, education, public opinion. Laws, regulations, education, public opinion. How do we change them? By engaging in free and equal discussion, discussing what would be better laws, better regulation, better education, better public opinion. In, in order to increase utility, which is the greatest happiness of the greatest number, in, which, everybody, right? Also, here, last point, is that in advanced stages of society, Mill says that the most important overlap in terms of common interest is actually negative. Negative. What do you want from me? What do I want from you? Right? I'm going to cook you a meal, but let's say I'm cooking meat and you're a vegetarian, like you don't want to eat my meal, right? Or, or you know, sort of, I give you some chocolate. Uh, by the way, feel free to take some chocolate. But it's, it's dark chocolate, you don't like that. Okay, so it's like us giving things to each other most of the time is not what we need. What we really need from each other is negative, to be left alone, and especially security. For, for you need me not to kill you. You need me not to hurt you. You need me not to steal things from you. Uh -huh. So our, our most important overlap is common interest against negative. And justice in this sense is just utility. Justice is the most important part of utility. And this is the harm principle, right? So if you think about utility in general, you have higher pleasures, lower pleasures, higher pleasures are important, but security is part of utility. Because if I, I give you a million dollars, but I don't give you security, do you care about the million dollars? No, because if you go to sleep at night and you're not sure you're gonna wake up in the morning, why do you need the million dollars, right? So justice is just utility, but it's the most important part of utility. Okay, 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 okay. So, um, maybe let's talk about higher pleasures just for one moment. Okay, so when I think about higher pleasures, I try to free associate, right? So Mill is talking about mastery, autonomy, self-determination, self-control, excellence, virtue, skill, development, especially this free development and higher pleasures. Now, think, let's think about this example. Mill says it's better to be a human being dissatisfied than, a, than an animal satisfied. Well, let's think about this in more detail. Mill says you cannot compare. Okay, let's, let's try. Let's try to think about this. Why, did, why he says he cannot compare. Imagine I, I propose to you a life of, a, of an animal. Right? I, I, you know, like to oversimplify, I strap you in a chair and I just put heroin into your vein or, 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 do, or dopamine into your brain. Would you agree? Would you agree? You will be happier for a moment, yes, maybe, but notice when you choose a life of an animal or when you choose a life of a heroin addict, you let go the control of your life. You lose autonomy, you lose self-mastery. And the problem is that when you lose autonomy, when you lose self-mastery, you cannot be sure that tomorrow your comfortable life of an animal will continue. If you choose to become an animal instead of a human being, maybe tomorrow you will be slaughtered, like cows are slaughtered or like sheep, sheep are slaughtered, right? So actually, again, I want to say that uh, um, well, it's like, again, Mill has assumption, not just baseless assumption, but assumptions based on observation. That human nature is a certain kind of thing. Human nature is pro-social, and we are interested in development. And development is intrinsically valuable, because development gives us higher pleasures, right? It's nice to read Moby Dick or Shakespeare or watch opera or whatever. Or even, even, be, a, even be a master craftsman, like be a, be a skilled uh, uh, carpenter. That's also higher pleasure. Again, and Mill thinks that's, that's valuable, interesting in and of itself. And again, think, think about yourself. This is an example we talked about in the lecture. Think about yourself. Think about if you're going to marry, what kind of spouse do you want to have? If you're going to have children, think about your children. You want them to develop themselves, right? So, so Mill, I think, is making a reasonable assumption, right? But then, so, so he says development is intrinsically valuable, but development is also instrumentally valuable. Development is deeply instrumentally valuable because... Uh, well, first of all, you're, you're, you're earning a wage, and, th and that's important. We live in a capitalist society. We, we, we earn our livelihood by being skillful, by being useful to others, right? Mm -hmm. so, so development is instrumentally valuable. But also, development is valuable in terms of security. Because you need, you need to be able to understand what's going on, right? It's like a, we want to get a shot from corona, you know, uh, against coronavirus. You need to be able to understand the, the, the medical literature to be, you know, ho ultimately hold the government accountable. Only educated individuals, only educated population can hold the government accountable, right? So, so higher pleasure, in this sense, it's like without these higher pleasures, without development, without freedom, without self-mastery, lower pleasures don't, don't count for very much because they are radically insecure. They're radically unreliable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, this is basically it. 
The last thing I want to say is uh, uh, criticisms. Before we get, and this is something that we just brainstormed with uh, students' previous class, but uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Mill's desire of development it has something in common with Rousseau's idea of uh, general will. So mm -hmm. if we if we act oh, yeah. if, we, if we act in accordance with general will, we uh, try to achieve common good, right? And Mill says that uh, we should maximize utility for ourselves and for society. Yeah. yeah, I think I think I think I talked about this last time. But again, both Mill and and Rousseau have this consensus view of society, right? That human beings are pro-social by nature. That again. F f it's like, if I live in a forest by myself, I cannot really develop, or I cannot develop as much as compared to me talking to you, right? So, so I help you understand political philosophy, you help me understand political philosophy. It's a win-win situation. So in, the, in this sense, yes, no, I agree, it's a common interest, common interest, yeah. Uh, in the general rule and the firm principle, they are some kind of the same, like, by the general well, rule, you need to act uh, to the common uh, good for the society, and by the harm principle, you, you, you are not able to harm the society. Well, it's like I think Mill um, thinks that we will act in pro-social ways because we're just interested. You don't need to induce people to act in pro-social ways. But you certainly need to prevent people actively, actively uh, uh, prevent people from, from, ac from acting in anti-social ways. So something like that, yeah. Okay, criticisms. So... Criticism number one, number zero, I'm sorry. It's liberty versus utility, it's number zero because I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> um, the picture I've given to you, this is a utilitarian justification of liberalism. In, in my picture, this is not really a criticism. Because Mill says utility is most important, but you cannot have utility without liberty. If you are not self-developed, if you're not autonomous, if you don't have mastery of your own life, then it's like, ima imagine a benevolent dictatorship. Well, today the dictatorship is benevolent, but if it's a dictatorship, who prevents? What, what stops the dictator from becoming malevolent tomorrow? So again, un unless citizens exercise control over the government, you cannot really trust the government to reliably act in the interest of the citizens. So this is, I think, a utilitarian justification of liberalism. This is, this is my position. On the University of London, you have a debate, and et cetera, et cetera. Right? Um, other criticisms. Maybe there's too much optimism in Mill. Again, can you have efficiency without freedom? The last sentence of On Liberty is that, he says, the government that will enslave its people will find that with small people, no great thing is possible. This is the last sentence of Mills on Liberty. But is it really true? Is it really true? Can you have some kind of super efficient dictatorial uh, 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 regime? Like again, Foucault talks about this discipline and punish, right? Biopower, for the sake of greater efficiency, but deeply anti-human, right? This is Mills' worst nightmare. Can he really say something against that? I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Says Mill being maybe he's too optimistic. Marxists would say free and equal discussion is nice, is fine. However, Mill, you are forgetting that there's ideology. You are forgetting that the, the free and equal discussion is not free and not, not equal. The game is rigged. You need violent revolution. Maybe. I mean, Marx says sometimes reform can do, but sometimes maybe you will need violent revolution. So it's kind of not really that much a criticism, but like a radicalization of Mill's position. And I am sure, by the way, that Mill would say that rebellion, violent uprising against feudal mm, privilege is justified. So slaves fighting for their freedom, for Mill is clearly justified. He just has this rosy utopian assumption that today we already live in a society where we're capable of being improved by free and equal discussion, and you don't need anything apart from free and equal discussion. Number three. Well, okay, I'm not sure about this, but so this kind of ra radical, hierarchical, aristocratic conservatism. If you assume that people are idiots, then this picture doesn't work. If you, if you assume that people are not capable of being improved by free and equal discussion, and you can only rule them despotically. I think what Mill would say is, again, something I mentioned already. I think Mill would say, well, okay, you could say that uh, I cannot rule myself, so I prefer to be ruled despotically, but that's self-defeating because unless the citizens hold the government accountable, there's no reason for the government to rule for the benefit of the people. So it's, I think there's kind of some room for back and forth here. Uh, uh, and point number four, number five, this is from Boucher. I think both of these criticisms can be answered, but let me just voice them. Point number four is that Mill is an anti-Christian libertine, that it's not really about utility or freedom, he just hates, he just hates uh, Christianity and just wants to destroy it. 
I don't think this is a, this is a serious objection. Mill is probably Mill has a justification like experiments in living, free speech. He thinks that this will really lead to progress, and it's not just his agenda. But this criticism is there in Boucher. Last criticism is that okay, Mill is a utilitarian fascist. You have a healthy person. Let's kill the healthy person and save five sick people. Well, again, I think this is a misreading of Mill because Mill is going to say security, security rules. That's very important. If if we as a society, if we allow as a healthy individual to be sacrificed for the, for the sake of you know, saving 10 sick people, how are we going to walk the streets? How are we going to get out of bed in the morning? So, uh, security is our radical common concern, not to mention that like in general, Mill is going to say, look, okay, you could save 10 sick people by sacrificing one, maybe. But long term, he talks about this permanent interest of man as a progressive being. It's much better to have this free and equal society where people develop, develop, uh, intellectually develop science, develop medicine, so that we don't need to sacrifice healthy individuals for the sake of sick ones. We find other ways of curing disease. And in the long run, this would be better. And again, just, just to be on the safe side, again, this very important idea for Mill. Why do you need slaves? Slaves is lower pleasure. That's not interesting. If you give women equal rights, if you give, if you give blacks equal rights, you will double, triple, multiply by 10 the amount of mutants that you have the amount of you know, wonderful doctors and surgeons and musicians and uh, artists and what have you. And like, as he says, human beings through development become a beautiful object of contemplation. The, the most important thing that a human being can do, the, mo the, 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 the most useful thing that a human being can do is cultivate themselves. He says, uh, um, uh, make the human race infinitely w more worth belonging to. All the kind of stuff, right? So this ideal, and again, in, I think, in the, you know, is, is, is Mill, does Mill assume psychological uh, uh, um, e egoism. Yes, he assumes psychological egoism. He, Mill, he's an egoist, but he egoistically wants women to have equal education because educated women will improve everybody's lives. It's going to be good for women, but it's going to be good for Mill as well. So again, it's an it's it's egoistic argument against racism. Give, you know, blacks PhDs and they will cure your cancer, you know, 10, 10 20 years down the line. Okay, I think, I think that's it. I think that this is this is this is my uh, 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 how should I put this? Uh, this is my rundown of a draft for my new lecture. But that, there you have it. Uh -huh. I have a question. So, mm -hmm. okay, in exchange, uh, so we freed like uh, women and uh, slaves from slavery, but in exchange they started to like remind us uh, how we treated them before, and because of that uh, they are not gonna like like us uh, in very one moment and gonna uh, uh, write like uh, mm -hmm. to we well, yeah, I understand because, like, I understand yeah. revenge uh, revenge people yeah. people are going to seek revenge like before, so well now we're gonna treat you yeah uh, the, I think in in general in principle that's a concern that's definitely a concern um, Neil assumes this problem away. He says we're capable of being approved by physical discussion, right? We get together, we discuss, we uh, uh, and, and we, we move forward constructively. Because like, his idea would be if, if, uh, if we try to take revenge, if people try to take revenge, we go back to this war of all against so everybody loses. So, so it's better for us to move forward into this. So it's like, you know, you talk about reparations for slavery. I think that what Mill was going to say is that we don't need reparations for slavery. We need um, basic, you know, basic rights, not, not just rights, but basic provisions for all. I mean, Marx talks about this from each according to his ability to each according to his need. It's, a Mar it's Marx's phrase, but you can see a lot of this phrase in Mill. Mill is for extensive social welfare. Let's not, let's not give reparations for slavery. Let's give extensive, so extensive social welfare to everybody in society so that, the so that the children of slaves don't feel oppressed, and, but everybody else also don't feel oppressed. And we don't need to engage in this, oh, who did what to whom? We're, we're good, we're good. Let's just move forward. Let's, let's focus on the challenges of tomorrow. Like, I don't know fighting the next pandemic or stopping the next meteorite hitting the earth or slow solving global warming like focus on the positive things down the line yeah. again is this oh, you could say oh, mill is unrealistic human nature is not like that human beings are vengeful it's not going to work that that's this is point number three this conservative argument maybe you're right i don't know so have a, have a discussion like that maybe this is a good counter argument against mill yeah, I, I the fact that the freedom of speech it doesn't mm -hmm. it contradicts uh, the revealed religion and uh, I understood correctly the real, uh, well, religion uh, yeah. we can get our education from one institute yeah uh, how can be a counter argument for me because Mill he, he claimed that 
No, we need to, yeah. to develop ourselves. We do not need to be dependent on some Well, Mill, I think, would say something very, very deeply plausible. If you take revealed religion, uh, well, I mean, there's no consensus. People disagree. There are different religions, and they disagree on what to count as, as the sacred book. But even within any given religion, Christianity or Islam or Judaism, Hinduism, whatever, right, you always have many interpretations. I mean, if you take Christianity, there are 40,000 denominations of Christianity. So again, like this appeal to revelation as a matter of practical fact, it doesn't work. I mean, remember, 30 years war, Protestants and Catholics went to war over the right interpretation of the Bible, and a quarter of the European population died. So it's kind of... It's, I, think, I think Mill is arguing on very strong grounds here. He's not against revealed religion. He's not against that. But he says, uh, fallibilism, fallibilism. Let's not assume that we are right. You know, be, be a Christian, but allow for the possibility that Christianity is not, is not the whole truth. Yeah. And in fact, he says, in fact, you, you can only, like, achieve the right interpretation of Christianity through free and equal discussion.